Good day to you. I am Professor Emma Fallendown. And Dr. Julius Tipover here with a warm welcome to Pitfalls. So, you might be asking, why Pitfalls? Or maybe not, since you're watching this already, and probably know that falls are very, very common among nursing home residents, and are really no fun, let me tell you. Can we prevent them all? No, but we can minimize the risk. How? You ask how, and we will tell you. The most important way is through regular assessment. And, of course, that means using what we call validated instruments. Once you learn to use these assessments of very easily identified risk factors, as we have, it becomes so simple to design ways to then reduce these risks. It's essential you begin with the following seven assessments. Get up and go. A baseline assessment of gait, strength, and balance. The five chair stand. Dual tasking. Standing and sitting blood pressure. Postrandial hypertension watches for the same drop in blood pressure after eating. Polypharmacy. Vitamin D deficiency. And finally, a post-fall assessment is the very best way to determine some risk factors by understanding the reason for a previous fall. And so, we'll share with you Tipover's timely tips to recognize when the risk for falling is high and help you discover those very simple secrets for effective interventions and preventions. Starting today, you can make a real difference in helping someone avoid painful pitfalls. Welcome back to Pitfalls. I am Professor Emma Fallendown, here to talk to you about the first assessment, Get Up and Go. In this episode, we'll have a look at gait, strength, and balance. What do we do? The resident will simply get up out of a chair and walk a short distance that allows us to time his or her performance. Ready, go. This becomes a useful baseline assessment at admission with a follow-up every year or when we notice any change in the resident's gait or balance. Now, how do we begin? First, measure out an 8-foot course with a stable chair at one end and a marker at the 8-foot turnaround point, a very important point. Make sure there's enough room to get up from the chair and walk around the marker and return to the chair to sit down, even when using a cane or walker. Now we are ready. Tell the resident that when you say go, he should get up from the chair, walk to and around the marker, then return and sit back down in the chair as quickly as possible, all while still being careful, of course. Your part is to observe if the resident can get up easily or needs to use his hands because his legs are weak. As the resident walks, watch for unsteadiness or abnormal gait. We should note the time it takes the resident to perform this task and repeat it at least twice in order to get an average. Now a normal performance time will be between 7 and 10 seconds. If the resident shows gait or balance issues or needs more than 10 seconds to complete the task, I will tell you he is at risk for a fall. For further evaluation of gait, strength, and balance, consult with a physical therapist. Keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. Until we talk again. Welcome again to Pitfalls. Dr. Julius Tip over here to talk to you about the assessment we call the five chair stand. Weakness in the lower extremities is one of the biggest risk factors for falls. This simple test is an easy way to evaluate a resident's leg strength and determine his risk for a fall. You ask how, and I will show you. First, place a straight back chair against a wall or heavy object to keep it from sliding. Have the resident sit and fold his arms across his chest just so. To begin, ask the resident to stand up completely and then sit back down five times. Remember, he is keeping his arms crossed. This is critical. A healthy resident will be able to perform the test in 30 seconds or less. If the resident needs more time or is unable to complete the test, 
He is at risk. An evaluation for leg strengthening exercises by a physical therapist is then required. And keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. They will thank you, I guarantee it. Hello, and welcome back to Pitfalls. Professor Emma Fallendown again, here to talk to you about dual tasking, which tests the ability to move and think at the same time. You may know that cognitive ability plays an important role in maintaining good balance, but I will tell you that older residents who are otherwise high-functioning frequently experience a decline in their ability to think and move at the same time. This puts them at increased risk for a fall while dual tasking. Now we can uncover this risk using the dual tasking assessment. This should be done as a baseline assessment at admission and a follow-up with yearly reassessments. How do we begin? We start the test by timing the resident as he walks a distance of 8 feet at his usual walking speed, just as if he were walking down the street. Next, we time him walking the same distance while performing a second task, 93, such as counting backwards by sevens, starting from 100. 79. Remember, this counting should be performed out loud. 72. If the additional task more than doubles his walking time, I will tell you the resident is at risk for a fall, and further Eight. cognitive assessment and other therapies may be required. Keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. Until we talk again. Dr. Julia is here to talk to you about the next assessment we call Standing and Sitting Blood Pressure. A sudden drop in blood pressure, known as orthostatic or postural hypertension, can lead to dizziness that may result in a fall. To assess a resident for the potential risk, a simple test can be used. First, take the resident's blood pressure after he has been sitting for at least five minutes. Then, ask the resident to stand up and take his blood pressure again at 30 seconds after standing, and then once more at 3 minutes after standing. If there is a drop of 20 points or more in systolic pressure, or 10 points or more in diastolic pressure, the resident is at risk of falling. Also remember that some older adults will have dizziness or feel faint, but others may not. The most common cause of this type of hypotension is a side effect of medication. So consult the resident's healthcare provider for evaluation and possible adjustments in dosages or types of medications. Also, be aware that in some cases, the drop in blood pressure is not a side effect of medication, but an inherent problem with the person's control mechanisms of their blood pressure. In these cases, the physician may prescribe a type of medication to prevent this from happening. You can also help the resident by making sure he gets adequate fluids during the day, reminding him to always get up slowly, and suggesting that he pump his feet or flex his ankles back and forth before standing in order to get blood circulating. This is critical. And keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. They will thank you, I guarantee it. Welcome back to Pitfalls. Professor Emma Fallendown here again to talk to you about our next assessment, postprandial hypotension, which is a sudden drop in blood pressure after a meal. You may know that in addition to postural or orthostatic hypotension, many residents exhibit drops in blood pressure after eating. This phenomenon is called postprandial hypotension, which can cause falls in nursing homes, but I will tell you it can also be addressed with a few easy interventions. 
To begin to test for postprandial hypotension, we take a resident's sitting blood pressure before a meal of reasonable size, at least 500 calories. We follow this with the second and third sitting blood pressure reading at 30 minutes and 60 minutes after eating. I will tell you that a drop of 20 points or more in systolic pressure or 10 points or more in diastolic pressure puts the resident at risk. Now, what do we do? To prevent a possible fall, residents with postprandial hypotension should be given coffee with meals and should be accompanied by an aid while walking after eating. In addition, we should also consult the resident's primary care provider for an evaluation of medications. Keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. Until we talk again. Welcome again to Pitfalls, Dr. Julius Tipover again to talk to you about the assessment we call polypharmacy. The more medications a resident takes, the greater the risk of falling. This is because certain classes of drugs, including antipsychotics, antidepressants, sedatives, hypnotics, overuse of diuretics, and antihypertensive and cardiac medications can affect blood pressure and balance. These drugs should be avoided in older residents unless absolutely necessary. You ask how, and the resident's primary care provider or pharmacist can provide further guidance in this area. At a minimum, residents should undergo an annual medication review to determine the appropriateness and safety of medications, while also identifying potential drug-drug and drug-disease interactions. This is critical. If you suspect a resident is at risk, consult the primary care provider for further evaluation. And keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. They will thank you, I guarantee. Professor Emma Fallendown back again here to talk to you about vitamin D deficiency and how low levels can lead to muscle weakness. You may know that low vitamin D levels are commonly seen in elderly people. I will tell you that although the reasons why are not completely understood, professionals in geriatrics agree that this vitamin D deficiency can be linked to muscle weakness that puts residents at increased risk of falling. Now, what do we do? The ideal way to boost vitamin D is to make sure residents get 30 minutes of exposure to sunlight each day without sunscreen. If at all possible, residents should be outside or encouraged to use the sunroom if one is available. Your vitamin D levels actually are pretty good. They now I will tell you that all residents should be evaluated by checking blood tests for 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels. Depending upon the level of deficiency, the primary care provider can then determine the proper level of supplementation for your residents. Keep watching to learn more ways to help someone avoid those painful pitfalls. Until we talk again. Welcome again to Pitfalls. I am Professor Emma Fallendown. And Dr. Julius Tipover here to talk to you about the post-fall assessment. Of all the risk factors for falling, the greatest is a prior fall. And the most effective intervention is to understand why the fall occurred, yes? That's why it's critical to conduct an immediate post-fall assessment. You ask how, and we will show you. Step 1. Determine the history of the fall. Ask the resident about his activity at the time it happened, why he thinks it occurred, and if there were any other associated symptoms such as dizziness, lightheadedness, or loss of balance. 
If the resident is unable to answer, use your own observations if you witnessed the incident, or use any information from any other eyewitness accounts to draw conclusions about any factors that might have contributed to the fall. Step 2. We conduct a complete physical exam. This means we record post-fall blood pressure, respiratory rate, and temperature. Check the resident's head for lacerations or bruises. Take the resident's pulse, noting rhythm disturbances. Evaluate the resident for gait steadiness, joint trauma, and leg strength, and conduct a neurologic assessment to determine levels of alertness and cognitive ability. Also, we take blood pressures, both sitting and standing, to evaluate for orthostatic hypertension again. Step 3. Evaluate the resident's function and behavior. Record any recent changes in walking or balance, and whether the resident was using his walker or cane if they have one. Examine any recent changes in his ability to carry out daily activities and continence status. And make special note of any behaviors that may have precipitated the fall, including wandering, agitation, or other forms of restlessness. Step 4. Re-evaluate the environment in which the fall occurred, looking for any hazards. Note the location of the fall, floor surface, and the type of shoes the resident was wearing. Step 5. Review the resident's medical history. Identify current and prior conditions that may have contributed to the fall, including medications, current medical problems, and significant changes in lab results within three weeks of the fall. I will tell you that taking this systematic approach, we can help determine possible reasons behind the resident's fall and make changes to significantly reduce his risk for another and potentially more serious incident. It's one of the best ways to protect the health of those for whom we're caring. And so, now you have many easy ways to recognize when the risk for falling is high, to help you then use more effective interventions and preventions. Thanks for listening, so you can make a big difference in helping someone avoid those painful pitfalls. And they will thank you also. You have our guarantee.